so anyway, right now we are in the chapter uh, on uh, Gampopa. So this is chapter 41 of this collection called 100,000 Songs of Milarepa. Uh, the 100,000 Songs of Milarepa um, has basically three uh, divisions, uh, three parts to it, uh, three cycles of, of teachings. They are arranged somewhat chronologically, cycle one and two. Uh, cycle three is miscellaneous. So cycle three doesn't necessarily um, follow any chronology. Uh, but one, one, one and two is, is continuous. Um, more or less, eh? you can kind of track eh? that the, the years are passing by. And so uh, 41, chapter 41, uh, is out of 44 chapters of cycle one and two. And so now we are reaching towards the end of uh, Milarepa's uh, life. Uh, although uh, this, um, Mm, at the end on chapter 44, you, you don't get like, you know, the end of Milarepa's life. It's, it's just uh, like these chapters, uh, 40 to 44, are named after uh, particular individuals, uh, important disciples that turn up uh, in Milarepa's life uh, towards the end. Mm, so Gampopa uh, was certainly one of them. And then according to later traditions, uh, Gampopa is seen as the successor. And in this group, we have looked at how, um, in fact, the one closest to Milarepa among his disciples uh, was probably uh, Rei Chongpa. Um, but Rei Chongpa uh, doesn't get, you know, like the, the main emphasis necessarily, uh, especially by later Kagyu traditions, uh, Gampopa was the main successor. And definitely in this chapter, chapter 41, he is definitely presented as the most important of all of Milarepa's uh, successors. Mm. But overall, I think like uh, when you begin to take like mm, each of those cycles pertaining to particular disciples, uh, often, you know, when that particular disciple is discussed, then the, that particular disciple is the most important, right. <laughs> you know? Kind of the way that people have said, like the way in, in Hinduism, you know, all the different gods and goddesses, the stories surrounding the gods and goddesses, you know, when it's a particular story about that particular god, or that particular goddess, you know, she or he uh, will trump all the other gods uh, and all the other goddesses. So it's hard to kind of, or, or not hard, in fact, it's a mistake then, I think, to think. This must be it, you know. Well, you only read one of many accounts of many people. But nonetheless, uh, later Kagyu traditions uh, see Gampopa as the main successor. And there's a reason to that, because the main Kagyu tradition is really a tradition that traces itself through Gampopa. So it's the particular Kagyu stream that is funneled through Gampopa. And then of course, you know, Gampopa becomes uh, the most important. Uh, so I have sometimes said, you know, and this is maybe a little scandalous perhaps to <laughs> very traditional minded types, uh, that lineage is really something that is constructed backwards. Right? I mean, we tend to think of lineage as something uh, that starts there or there and then comes to here. Yeah. I mean, from one perspective, the most common one, yes, lineage started over there and then came over here mm -hmm. or came from up there and down here. Right. But uh, in many other ways, yeah, lineage is constructed backwards. Yeah, so you ask me, uh, who, who is your teacher or, or who are your main teachers? I say, well, so and so and so and so and so. Right? Or I tell you this person. Well, then this person, who, you know, who was their teacher? Well, that and that and that and that and that and that and that, right? So then with regards to me, 
this succession of teachers is the main stream, the main way the stream flowed down to me. So in this way, right, lineage is constructed backwards. <laughs> we're, we're tracing our genealogy. In this case, spiritual genealogy. We are, and in doing so, we are perhaps also articulating, staking a claim. <laughs> you could even say that on our pedigree, <laughs> our spiritual pedigree. <laughs> and so I think we should be aware of some of the dynamics eh, that are going on here. Mm. So chapter 41 gives us a version of Gampopa's uh, background, Gampopa's life. So the first, I would say, let's see if I remember. In, in this, this edition, this, this version of uh, the, the 100,000 songs of Milarepa, uh, basically, Mm. up to about, uh, so for one, two, three, four, maybe about five pages of the of this first five pages of this chapter were given Gampopa's background, right? Uh, somewhere around 491 or more, more you know, really in 492, uh, then uh, the first time Gampopa figures in, I mean, the first time Milarepa figures in Gampopa's life, mm -hmm. starting on page 492. And this is related to uh, Gampopa having uh, uh, these recurring dreams uh, of a dark-skinned yogi coming to him. Yeah. Then in 492, the significance of this recurring dream which initially is interpreted by his peers, Gampopa's peers, uh, to be some kind of potentially uh, ob potential obstacles. Then 492. Um, we are slowly. Uh, um, uh, introduced to the uh, the fact that actually uh, it's Milarepa in some ways reaching out uh, to pull Gampopa in his direction. <laughs> so a number of beggars uh, kind of turn up. Uh, there's the three beggars, the initial beggar, and then at some point another beggar uh, that eventually then led Gampopa uh, to finding Milarepa, right? Uh, next section, it's uh, Gampopa uh, following Milarepa's instructions and then various omens and experiences and signs uh, were experienced by Gampopa uh, in which then Milarepa unpacks them for him, explains the significance. Milarepa... Mm, telling him to persevere until finally uh, Gampopa reaches a point. Uh, and in, from other sources here, I don't think they actually say this, but pr uh, basically 13 months later, uh, Milarepa says, you, you, you have gained enough experience. I've given you all the instructions you need. And, and based on those instructions, you have gained enough experience now to be on your own. So now you can go. You can go. They were in Western Tibet at this point. So Milarepa says, now you can go, go to Eastern, uh, go to Central Tibet, uh, U, uh, this area called U, uh, which is Central Tibet. And so now he says, you can go to U and go to this place called Gampodar. Gampodar is an area, specifically there's a mountain there called Gampo. And this is how Gampopa uh, gains his name. Often people are named after where they came from. In this case, it's, it's not where he came from, but where he eventually settled and then eventually developed into uh, 
an important teacher. So then from that point on, he was known as Gampo Pa, like Tonga Pa is from Tonga, in a particular area in northeastern Tibet. Tonga Pa, the founder of the Gelugpa lineage. Then you have um, Long Chen Pa, again, came from this area. Anyway, um, so then Gampopa uh, went, you know, and uh, uh, the chapter ends with uh, Milarepa sending Gampopa off after giving Gampopa some final teachings, and then Gampopa left. Yeah, so this is an overview of basically what occurs in chapter 41. There is not actually a lot of like instructions in chapter 41. Just one or two that is actually instructions. The rest are all Milarepa explaining the significance of Gampopa's dreams slash visions. So here's a footnote. Whenever the, the translator has to say dream, right? It's it's really something that is between dream and vision. Not just in, in the case of this, this book, in any liter Tibetan literature, and whenever you see in the English to say, so-and-so had a dream, it's really, depending on context, it could be referring to what we would call dreams, and it could also be visions. Yeah, so it's not so firmly just what we call dreams. Right? It's, it's also vision, yeah? visions that are experienced, and maybe even in waking yeah? mode. So, so do, do know that, okay? When they talk about dreams, yeah? it's not just dreams. Yeah? It could also be visions, uh, visions that come especially between... Yeah? Uh, when you're shifting consciousness from the dream state to the waking state, uh, that's that's like uh, when a bardo of sorts, uh, when things are a little unstable, then visions emerge. Yeah. So yeah. So anyway, this is um, chapter forty-one. Yeah. Mm. So I thought what I'll do is to give you, you know, and then now at this point, uh, uh, my summary uh, of uh, each of the page. <laughs> um, but before I do that, let's see if you have any questions or comments. Yeah, so if not, okay, um, on page 487. So this gives us a short you know, biography of Gampopa, you know, which, with, with quite a number of details, you know, which uh, I don't remember exactly, but I don't think you know, the chapters dedicated to other disciples you know, ever gave us so much details. Yeah, and so this, you know, uh, from the perspective of like, um, uh, you know, kind of historical studies of important individuals, this this instantly tells us, right? All these details were already collected and put into place because at this point, yeah, when this collection was put together, Gampopa has become important. Yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of details are available. Now, with regards to the details that are available, how literal and reliable they are, that's, that's often you know, up for questioning. <laughs> um, 
you know how like you often like maybe some of you have come across how um, some have pointed out there's so scanty details about the historical Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then people are kind of like surprised, right? Like, wow, if it was so important, how can it be so sketchy, the details, you know? Uh, if you understand historical processes and, uh, and, and the way in which history is written and composed, you totally, you know, it's, it's a total non-issue why, why it's so sketchy. At, at least in the case of the historical Jesus, two things. One, the main reason, uh, I would say, the people who did believe in his claims very much expected the world to end within their lifetime, or at least the world as they knew it to end within their lifetime. And it ends with Jesus coming back. So why would they care to know anything about when he was a child, when he was a teenager? <laughs> <laughs> when he was a baby, no, right? Who cares? No, we can ask him if we want to know when he comes back later. So nobody cared, nobody cared, nobody cared, nobody cared. And then he's still not back. 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 And before long, he's never coming back yet. Now we're still waiting for him to come back. Then secondly, then everyone who was a historical witness to him as a person, by the time people wanted to know, all those people were dead. Yeah, so it's unimportant. Only when they become important, then there's interest in, right? doing some archaeology of sorts. And when you fail to find that, make it up. <laughs> As any good storyteller would do. See, these are not, right? These are not journalists the way we expect our journalists to be. Yeah, so you, you cannot fault them. Yeah, they told stories and filled in all the gaps to inspire. And of course, that also opens the door for the people who wanted to tell the story to discredit. <laughs> that becomes fair game, you know. If you're going to make up stories about inspiring, we're going to make up stories to discredit. <laughs> So anyway, here, you know, a lot of details are given on Gampopa. Uh, those of you who were here the last couple of weeks, you know, when I talk about, I've been reading this uh, really uh, interesting study, historical study of Gampopa based on the earliest available material. And so you can see how Gampopa's life was, life story was written and rewritten that there's some, er, the earliest accounts are all very sketchy. Then they begin, they begin to fill up. Yeah? Then the, the, the portrait of Gampopa becomes more and more robust. Yeah? And, and the one we have here is pretty robust. Yeah, so this collection yeah, was put together, no doubt based on oral traditions and earlier, you know, uh, it wasn't made up by the compiler uh, out of nothing. The compiler, you know, fill in a lot of uh, uh, gaps. Uh, but this account uh, is from about, I think, uh, 300 years later, something around that. So anyway, so uh, in the first, it says that Gampopa's appearance uh, uh, was prophesied in, in, in many different uh, contexts. Uh, 
So it says, for example, uh, Gampopa's spiritual grandfather, Marpa, Milarepa's teacher, already made uh, prophecies about uh, Gampopa's appearance. Then Milarepa himself, Jitsun, uh, is called here the Jitsun, the venerable one. Milarepa himself uh, received visions from Vajra Yogini, uh, Vajavarahi, prophesying Gampopa. And then, furthermore, uh, it says that in the uh, Samadhi Raja or the King of Samadhi Sutra, um, he was also prophesied. Uh, but in particular, uh, this chapter here, quotes the Mahakaruna Pundarika Sutra, uh, which is the what's known as the Lotus Sutra. Uh, there's a prediction of a monk called the physician. Mm. And that is one of the names uh, uh, that Dampopa was known as. Uh, in fact, Milarepa seems to call him that. Hey, physician. Uh, Larje. Uh, hey, physician. <laughs> um, so at the bottom of that page, uh, Dakpo Laje. Uh, Dakpo is where Gampopa came from. Dakpo. Dakpo Laje. Um, so it says, you know, that here at the very bottom, he says, uh, there's a great Bodhisattva Mahasattva who manifests the realization of the 10th Bhumi. So it's said that Gampopa is already, Gampopa is in fact the emanation of a 10th Bhumi Bodhisattva. Uh, according to the Sutra system, the 11th Bhumi is the level of Buddha. Um, according to Vajrayana, the 13th Bhumi uh, is the level of Buddha. But it's safe to say that when they say that he's 10th Bhumi, it means uh, next step, Buddhahood. <laughs> next stop, Buddhahood. Yeah. <laughs> it's at the end of, 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 of the stations. Uh, so that he's a 10th Bhumi uh, Bodhisattva. <laughs> Uh, so then we are told uh, that uh, on page 488, uh, he's born uh, in this area called Niao, uh, to this uh, clan called Nip. Uh, and here, interestingly, it is said that from a very young age, he was uh, taught uh, and, 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 and mastered. Mm, uh, it says merely at the age of 15, he studied the mantra tradition, meaning Vajrayana, of the Nyingma, including this very important Nyingma Tantra called Guhya Garba, Heruka Gyalpo Tantra, the Tantra of the Peaceful and Wrathful Deities, and the Net of Great Compassion Tantra. So he was, uh, his family uh, were Nyingma practitioners. Then in particular, from his father, Apparently, his father was a physician as well, and he was trained as a physician from his father. And at that point, his name was Dharma Drak. And that at the age of 22, he was married to the daughter of a powerful chieftain. Uh, they had a son and a daughter, but tragically, the son and daughter died in a very short period between the two of them first buried his son. It said that by the time he was done burying his son, came back, daughter died. Then before long, the wife passes. That's 488 to 489. 489, basically, the wife said, I don't have any other worry because Gampopa could tell that she's still holding on and not going. So Gampopa, to allay her worry, said, what are you worried about? You know, what are you worried about? You know, why, why is the problem? Um, and what is the problem? And she said, you know, I'm not worried about anything at this point, except for I can't stand it if you were going to remarry. So he said, oh, don't worry. I'm done with that, you know. I mean, the trauma of, you know, losing uh, two kids 
and then wife in succession. He said, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with the world. And so then he pledged to her, you know, I, I will not, I, I will become a Dharma practitioner. Uh, and so that was what he promised. Uh, so then when she passed, uh, he divided her wealth uh, or their wealth uh, into three parts and gave away two parts and kept one part for his own uh, needs. And now that he's going to simplify his life and become a Dharma practitioner. So that takes up, it takes us up to 490. And in 490, um, that takes us up to middle of 490. Questions, comments, any observations? <laughs> In this translation that I'm reading, it says there was a pestilence in the area. So it sounds like a pandemic of some kind. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that took took the, the daughter and the son and the wife. Very common. Uh, yeah. Either, you know, a disease, you know, a, 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 a pandemic <laughs> right. came through the area, a pestilence. Or the other thing is uh, starvation. Very common. Yeah. Founder of Dugongkagyu basically, uh, I think, lost both parents to starvation. So that that was, you know, between disease and bad weather. Uh, it was very common. 50s was probably a pretty ripe old age. And also, would you say that his what we've heard so far is really unusual for that time that someone would have as much uh, dharmic exposure plus the training in medicine and so forth? That really is, is um, not not that unusual. Not that unusual. In fact, like Milarepa, right? I mean, the main story we have of Milarepa is the biography of Milarepa also compiled by the same person who compiled this, Zhang Yong Heruka. Uh, in that one, he presents Milarepa as basically more or less unschooled in the Dharma when the time he arrived at Marpas, mm -hmm. except with a short um, period of studying with a, supposedly a Dzogchen master, mm -hmm. and before that, a black magician. Right, Th those two stand out right? in in the life of Milarepa as we we know it now. Uh, but there are older biographies of Milarepa that that gave you know a list of things that he was trained in, mm -hmm. and and that list matches, right? it, maybe not in content, but in how long that list with uh, Gampopa's training. Okay. Yeah. Now how. Train, train, uh, we have no idea. Yeah. Uh, when it says, oh, you know, he, he, he learned Guhya Gaba Tantra, uh, he learned, you know, mm, blah, blah, blah of the Nyingma lineage. Uh, I mean, it could, be, it could mean anything from like, you know, his father was a village lama who know, knew how to recite these texts <laughs> to, you know, commentary and sub-commentary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. It's unclear. Okay. Yeah. Now then on page 90, okay, now that that is when you get uh and I, uh, this is probably, uh, um, you know, pretty accurate. Uh, 490 on gives us uh, his training, uh, his formal training, right? At the age of 15, uh, it was basically what his father taught him. Mm -hmm. uh, but now uh, at this age, 
And he's now maybe in his 30s, something like that, if I remember correctly. Um, he now um, sought out formal training. And at that point, probably the most prominent group that provided formal training was the tradition, was the uh, disciples and the descendants, uh, spiritual disciples and descendants of Atisha, which, which we know uh, them as the Kadampas. And in fact, this, this name Kadampa as, as a identity marker uh, was current uh, in, in, in Gampopa's time. And so he went, uh, so it's so interesting here in this biography, it says he went to one of the key Kadampa masters, uh, Putowa. Uh, Putowa was one uh, of the students of Dromtom. Uh, Dromtom is the main successor of Atisha. So you have Atisha, the Bengali, uh, Indian Bengali master that came to Tibet. After him, uh, his main successor, a Tibetan called Dromtompa. And Dromtompa, uh, one of Dromtompa's key disciples uh, was uh, Putowa. So apparently Gampopa went to Putowa, but no, no chemistry. <laughs> so here is reported as Gampopa saying, you know, I, I have come from this, you know, where he came from, Niao, uh, seeking Dharma. Can you uh, let me in uh, and also give me some food? So apparently Putowa says, I have dharma to give. I have no food to give. <laughs> then in a complaint of sorts, uh, Dampopa uh, thought in his mind and even quoting this Nyingma Tantra, Puhya Garba, uh, says that, you know, teachers are compassionate in four ways. And then in his mind, he was like, mm, he's not compassionate at all. <laughs> I'm not sure what to make of this. Mm, because clearly, right, right after that, it says yeah, he has, Gampopa has 16 measures of gold. Yeah, 16 ounces, 16 grams, who knows, mm -hmm. right? Oh, approximately 337.5 grams. Yeah. Uh, so this is 600 grams of gold, 21 ounces. That's a lot of gold, whether his time or you, our time, you know. So why would he say to Putawa, you know, give me food? <laughs> Not sure what that's all about. <laughs> Was Gampopa testing Putawa? <laughs> uh, who knows? The reason to be a little suspicious of this story <laughs> is because, you know, much later, you know, uh, conflict and competition between uh, what's, what, what eventually became known as Kagyupas and Kadampas became more and more pronounced. So that uh, later period conflict could have been read back. This is the filling the gaps part. <laughs> could have been read back into, uh, you know, 300 years earlier. Based on current, you know, information that we have, you know, research that has been done, I think we can say that basically, Gampopa represented one branch of the Kadampa family. And when that family became more and more influential and stronger, eventually it became something else that we now know as Kagyupa. And as they say, you know, 
the most vicious fights are the fights within a family. <laughs> so, <laughs> although interestingly in this account, right, Gampopa's famous, uh, famous among certain circles, that is, Gampopa is famous, I've shared it with you, you know, he said, that demon, Dromtompa. <laughs> you remember that? In other accounts of, of Gampopa's uh, time with Milarepa, uh, when Milarepa asked Gampopa, who did you study with? You know, and Gampopa said, I studied with so-and-so, you know. Then Milarepa apparently said something very, like, critical of the Kadampas. <laughs> but it's not here. Hmm? Interestingly, it's not here. In fact, here Gampopa says, I'm not discrediting the empowerments that you have received huh? later on huh? when they actually met. And Gampo Milarepa says, Tell me what you have received, what you have learned. And then Gam there, Milarepa simply said, I'm not discrediting what you have received. Well, what I'm saying is, well, you need more mojo. <laughs> You need the blessings that come from my lineage eh, in order to break through, and I will give it to you. That's the extent eh, of Milarepa's comments about Gampopa's prior training. But in the, I believe, biography of Milarepa, eh, compiled by same guy, Tsangnyong Heruka, there, I think, eh, is where those famous words were said by Milarepa. He said, uh, what you have uh, from, from, from your prior training uh, is simply the outer shell. Uh, why? Because Atisha was prevented to teach the inner essence by that demon Drom Tom. <laughs> and Drom Tom is Atisha's main successor. <laughs> Yeah, but it doesn't occur here. So anyway, uh, this meeting with Putoa kind of failed. No connection was made. Uh, but nonetheless, um, he became a Kadampa monk. Again, what this shows is that there, there were different, you know, communities that traced themselves to Atisha. That, that he did not connect, even if we take at face value what is said here, that he did not connect with Putowa, one of the main uh, Kadampa figures, didn't mean that Kampopa thought, oh, you know, this Kadampa thing, I, I will not. But he, he went, he went to, so it says at the bottom of 490, he went to a monastery in Penyu, and there, uh, Lama Gachiowa, he took ordination and was given the name Sonam Rinchen. Then from uh, Geshe Shawa, uh, uh, this is Shawar Lingba, is Shawari. Uh, Shawar Lingba, no, sh not Shawari, sorry. Shawar Lingba and Jadu Zimba. Uh, he received uh, trainings in the Sutrayana, uh, Sutra Lankara. Abhisamaya Lankara, Abhidhamma Kosha. Then from Mangyupa Loden Sherap, he received many teachings on the Vajrayana, the Tantras, such as Hevaja, Guhya Samaja, and he received empowerments, Abhishekas, and key instructions. And then from Geshe Nyu Rumpa and Gyacha Riva, he received all the teachings of the Kadampa lineage. So then he focus on practicing them. And so he, he progressed well, had visions that said that he was approaching the 10th Bhumi. So this is on middle of 491. And that is the start. When things were going well, going well, going well, then he started to have this dream where a dark-skinned yogi with an enormous body kept turning up. 
So then when he explained this to his, his, his peers, eh, the fellow monks, and they say, oh, for a monk eh, to keep dreaming about a yogi coming, eh, this could be a bad sign. Eh, although they didn't say definitely bad, they said this could be a bad sign. Uh, you, you better go uh, receive this white eh, Achalanatha. Achalanatha is a wrathful deity. Achala means unmoving. Natha means Lord. Uh, the unmoving Lord. So this is one of the key practices of the Kadamba lineage. Uh, so his fellow monks say, you, you, you better you know, receive a transmission of Achalanatha uh, to dispel any potential obstacles that your dreams might be indicating. And so he went and he received that and he practiced that. But rather than the dreams dis disappearing, it became more uh, frequent. Now 42. All right. Ah, now it's telling us on Milarepa side of things, uh, what was going on. <laughs> so basically, the basic biography of Gampopa up to the point of meeting Milarepa is given until page 491. Again, let me pause here. Any questions or comments? So this dark skinned yogi, does it end mm -hmm. there? I mean, I mean, does he is that further on down the story that we just haven't gotten to yet? I'm, I'm nothing happened with the dark skinned yogi? Just a vision. Just you know, a and vision. dreams that he keeps turning up. But it wasn't an obstacle, it, it didn't manifest into anything that was an obstacle? No, in fact, uh this is probably referring to Milarepa. Ah, okay. Although, uh, when they finally meet, Kampopa goes, the, you know, this, this account doesn't go, ah, you are the one I've been seeing. Right. Yeah, it doesn't like, you know, but it's a hint that yeah, right. far from obstacle, this is Milarepa, you know, yeah. sending his juju. <laughs> <laughs> doing Jedi mind tricks and pulling Kampopa to him. Neat. Good story. Yeah. And so the dark skin could be referring to the uh, his com Milarepa's complexion of eating only nettles. Net okay. <laughs> it's said in Milarepa's biography, at one point in his life, he all he ate was nettles, so even his complexion turned green. <laughs> interesting yeah present day doctors might say he had some kind of condition you know <laughs> and sort of malnutrition <laughs> <laughs> neat story I like it yeah So meanwhile, now continuing, right, page 492. Meanwhile, you know, it, uh, this, this story then takes us over to the other side, right? And the other side is uh, like, like quite literally uh, geographically, uh, a distance away uh, towards Western Tibet is Milarepa and his band of itinerant disciples. So... Uh, Rechong Dojedra is mentioned, Shiwao, Seben Repa, Drigum Repa, Nginzon Tompa. These are all names of disciples that we have already met uh, in earlier chapters. Uh, and the constant one was Rechong, uh, Rechongpa. Uh, so they were all gathered together with Milarepa. And last time we talked about this, yeah. 
So they one day said, you know, oh, now that your body is getting old, you know, uh, so when you pass to uh, another realm, we will need someone to guide us, uh, to dispel hindrances for us the way that you have been doing. Uh, so who can this person be? Uh, why don't you give all your authority to this person? So in likelihood, uh, if this happened, this probably happened, they are, what are they doing? <laughs> Creating <Yeah>. competition. <laughs> what? Creating competition. Uh, no, I think they are advocating for someone to be publicly recognized as the successor. Okay. And it's, it's basically them saying, it's time for you to recognize someone. Okay. And probably all of them kind of were kind of, you know, hint, hint, Ray Chung Right. Okay. Is the obvious candidate. Now, it shows you, you know, here it shows you that something of that business is going on. Then in the next paragraph, the Jitsun slightly displeased said, all right? Now, what's that slightly displeased all about? Um, well, basically, you know, he's a little annoyed that they are, you know, trying to force him to say, Rechungpa, you are my successor. Yeah. So maybe even in protest <laughs> or to humble Rechungpa, he goes, there is a disciple who will be able to spread and make my activity flourish. I will look to see where he is tonight. Come tomorrow morning and I will tell you. So maybe there was still hope, you know. Yes, he's going to say Rejongba. But already, like, wait, what do you mean to see where he is right now? <laughs> so next morning they all came and he said, the noble being who will hold my teachings, the Vais who will be filled with the key instructions and who will be able to spread the teachings in the 10 directions is the is one who has been ordained as a fully ordained monk by the name Haji. And you can imagine, you know, they're all like, what? <laughs> they're probably like, you know, you never like monks. <laughs> the whole time we were hanging out with you. <laughs> what do you mean this fully ordained monk? <laughs> You can almost see him going, uh-huh, yeah, gotcha, right? He ends this announcement with, ha-ha, <laughs> gotcha. He laughed and sang the song of realization. <clears throat> the song is basically saying, you know, all the good stuff will be given to the worthy vessel. <laughs> 494 at the top. <clears throat> a few words of Milarepa's meditative experience, though they certainly will liberate the vital points. And so it's a way of Milarepa says, yeah, you all got some of those already. So it's enough huh, for your own purposes. But they are not given to unworthy vessels. But if a worthy vessel comes, I will give them freely. As in give all of them freely. If my son, the teacher, arrives, I will give them to him. There is still hope, you know. I can see, you know, in, in, in his main group, like, like saying, Rechung, but come on, you know. Step up, be the worthy vessel so that he will recognize you as the successor. Like stop arguing with him. <laughs> stop being difficult with him. <laughs> Turns out that it's Gampopa. <laughs> now, 
the when they started you know like you know someone who will who will play your role to dispel our obstacles blah 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 in that sense Gampopa didn't fulfill that Gampopa got his own disciples later he did it for his disciples but in so far as Milarepa's you know itinerant uh, Repa disciples Repa's are those who wear the white cotton shawl these wanderers probably they had no interest in Gampopa. They went on their own, you know, probably Rechompa became practically the main leader of that group of itinerant disciples post Milarepa. Now we go back to Gampopa. <laughs> Uh, so here, famine, yeah, the other problem at the top of 494. At that time, the precious Lord, meaning Gampopa, had gone out for a while to do circumambulations. That year, there was a great famine in that land, and below the monastery gate, there were three beggars sitting there hoping to receive something. <clears throat> so while Gampopa was circumambulating, he, he overheard these three beggars talking. Basically, the beggars are saying, you know, oh, I hope these monks will give us some, some, some food, you know. Then they started talking about Milarepa. And it said Kampopa overheard that. And for reasons that he unknown to him, he, he had a goosebumps, you could say. <laughs> Hair-raising goosebumps you know, when he heard the name of Kampopa. And then tears came to his eye and stood up and prostrated in the direction where Gampopa, where the Jitsun that resided. This is middle of 495. Then it says, then again and again, he performed the seven branches. This is the seven branch puja that uh, in the Shantideva class, you know, I talk about quite a bit. Also pointing out that in the biography of Jigden Sumgun, uh, the oldest biography, the one practice that is mentioned more than once, and there are several practices that are mentioned once, once here, once there, but the one that is mentioned a number of times is performing the seven branches. And so you can see this is also something that Gampopa himself uh, did a lot. Then he basically said to the beggars, he said, uh, you all know this, where this guru, this, this Lama is, you know, can you please take me to him? But two of them said, oh, we don't know where he is. The old, the eldest one said, we, I know. So I, I will take you. Then that night, it is said that Kampopa had a dream, vision. Uh, in there, he was blowing on the Tibetan horn and he was beating a big drum. And then the meaning of that dream and also in that dream, there's a, a young girl who looked to be from Mun. Mun is now basically in the area that we call Bhutan. So southern Tibet gave her a skull cup full of milk and told him to drink it and said, this will not be enough for the animals here, but drink this and it will help not only these animals, but all sentient beings of the six realms. Then later, Kampopa reflected back and understood this dream. Those humans who heard the drum were those who must train gradually along the paths and stages and are not suitable vessels for the Vajrayana. The Kadampa gurus are so very kind. This statement here, right? The Kadampa gurus are so very kind. Hmm? 
is talking about how mm, it's it, it's insinuating that the Kadamba method uh, is a gradual method of taking disciples uh, through the stages uh, and the paths, uh, the, the paths that lead to the stages, to the next, to the next, to the next. Uh, so he's saying, mm, so the Kadamba teaches, uh, the Kadamba tradition is so kind uh, because majority of people need that. But nonetheless, the animals that heard my drum are my great yogi disciples who will stay in mountain retreats. Here yogi, okay, doesn't mean non-monastic. It just means uh, those who don't live in monasteries or in villages, but those retreatant types who will stay in mountain retreats. This dream was an omen that I will rely solely on Guru Milarepa's key instructions on the path of means and Mahamudra. This, right, this section, later Gampopa reflected back about this dream. Uh, again, not sure what to make of this. <laughs> it's an odd uh, unpacking, I think, of that dream. But whatever it is, <laughs> there's a certain sense that you know it's 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 kind of a jab uh, against the Kadampas. Anyway, it says you know. Next morning, together with the oldest of the three beggars, he went in search of Milarepa. And this old beggar led him up to a certain point and then abandoned him. <laughs> and he was lost. Hmm. And this curious uh, thing, the, the, the beggar saying, but uh, up, up ahead, there is a monastery called Sakya. You can go get help there. Which is referring to the great institution of learning, the Sak Sakya tradition. Yeah, he said, you, you, you can go, go, go get help there. And so I wonder, again, if it is a later kind of... Uh, uh, you know, retelling of this that said that, you know, that there was a chance Gampopa could have gone to Sakya and become a Sakyapa. Mm -hmm. But even though he was wandering lost, he, he never went there. <laughs> so it, it could mean something like that over here. Mm -hmm. That the Sakyapas at this point, their reputation is they were great uh, uh, great uh, masters of the tantric system. Not necessarily great meditators, but great in the exposition of the tantras. And later, they also became great in the exposition of the sutras, uh, of the sutrayana material. But initially, the Sakya family was known for their mastery of the Tantras. And only later, they became known also for logic, grammar, and Sutrayana topics. But then, the beggar reappeared. <laughs> and said, oh, you know, don't worry, you're not actually lost. I will show you the way. So again, there, you know, when, when the beggar first disappeared and say there's a Sakya monastery, there's a monastery called Sakya, you can go there. And the fact that Gampopa even lost, didn't go there. Then the, the beggar reappeared. So it's almost like you can think of it as like a temptation, you know, like, do you want to connect with the Sakyapas and end up there? He did not. So the beggar 
reappear. And then it says, uh, later Gampopa uh, felt, oh, these beggars must be Milarepa's doing. Uh, then he continued on. Yeah. Mm, and one merchant, chieftain, uh, he met, uh, uh, told him where Milarepa was, uh, in Chua, in Drin. And Kampupa was very happy, uh, hugged the merchant around his neck, weeping many tears. Then he went in the direction, in that direction, uh, Dingri. Uh, there, you know, exhaustion uh, from all his travels and all the challenges that he basically physically broke down and he was needing water and at a point thinking that he might be dying he supplicated and prayed said if I don't see the Jitsun in this lifetime 497 then may I be reborn quickly to meet him and then at that point it says a Kadampa teacher from Jayu came where are you going? He says, I'm going to go see Milarepa. And Jayuwa says, I'm, I'm going in the same direction. So let's travel together. So this, this Kadampa from Jayu. So then they traveled together. Now, the story takes us to Milarepa's side. So there it says that Milarepa, you know, was teaching and suddenly he stopped and he burst out laughing. And then they asked, but well, why are you laughing? Huh? Uh, then he explained. Basically here, uh, he's saying, I, 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 I'm watching, you know, the progress of this disciple that I told you about. Uh, he's getting closer. <laughs> then he says, day after tomorrow, he will arrive. So true enough, now we're in 498. And... And the person that he told to uh, is this woman. Uh, and he's, and, and Gampopa, uh, uh, Milarepa basically said, you know, and if you can help him to direct him to my uh, direction, uh, it'll be very good. And so true enough, Gam, Gampopa and the Kadampa uh, from Jayu, they, they came, met her, this woman, and this woman directed them. Uh, and Gampopa again thought, oh, she too must be sent by Milarepa. And because this woman said to, to them, actually, Milarepa predicted you guys, specifically Gampopa. And he, he's, Milarepa said, you are the destined <laughs> successor. So it said, because of that Milarepa, Gampopa was inspired, but also pride. And because of that, Milarepa, when he finally arrived, Milarepa did not see him for two weeks. <laughs> Instead, asked his disciples to give him find, find a cave for him to sleep in, give him a pot and some firewood so that he can you know, make his own food and, and take care of himself. So then two weeks later, Milarepa agrees to meet Gampopa. So here, the other monk that traveled with Gampopa also came, uh, and the other monk uh, asked for blessings. And Gampopa says, I will give, uh, but, uh, you know, you give me uh, what you are most attached to, uh, and I'll give my blessings. Then apparently, now I'm skipping ahead, okay, to 501. Um, but apparently that monk said, I don't have anything to give you. And then then, then Milarepa said, you big liar, you hypocrite. 
You are hiding all kinds of gold underneath your robes. In any way, you didn't come here to see me. You were on your way to go make business, selling wool, or buying or selling or whatever. Then it said that Kampopa goes, oh, you know, Nilarepa sees everything. <laughs> now, in the couple of pages that I skipped, it's basically Nilarepa saying to Gampopa, yes, I've been waiting for you. So even there, you know, seated to Nilarepa's right is Rechungpa and Shiwa O sitting on both sides. But it is said that Milarepa did a Jedine mind trick again, so that all three of them look the same, and Gampopa could not tell who was who. But I don't know uh, if Jedine mind trick needs to happen here. Basically, you know, there were no photos, you know, no, no, no iPhones at that time, you know, and Milarepa could, uh, Gampopa could be like, wait, which one is? <laughs> you know, Milareva. Mm. Uh, so then they exchange tea. Huh? Uh, this is before before the Kadampa asked for blessings. Um, so uh, Gampopa made tea for. Milarepa and his disciples, eh? in return, Milarepa said, we should also give him tea. Uh, so this is, this is quite, you know, uh, an honor. Right? Usually it's the disciple offering tea, but here Milarepa wants to show everyone present that this is not an ordinary disciple. <laughs> At the bottom of 501 eh, is when Milarepa then, you know, after the, the, the other monk left, you know, then Milarepa said, you know, teacher from U, which means central Tibet, you know, what have you previously received in terms of Abhisheka empowerment? And so Gampopa relayed everything and told how Samadhi had arisen in his mind stream, you know, the stability of mind. And then Milarepa burst out laughing. Ha ha, if you squeeze sand, you will not get oil. You will only get oil from mustard seeds. Meditate on my Atung Chandali. And then you will see the essence of mine. For this practice, I'm not saying that the Abhishekas you received before were unqualified, but because the great power of Tendra is involved, interdependence. You must have the blessings of my tradition. And so that is given eh, in the context of Milarepa doing a Vajra Yogini empowerment for Gampopa. And from there, Milarepa started to give formal instructions to Gampopa. And specifically, Gampopa used the Meditation of Tummo. That's what the Atung Chandali is referring to. Uh, Atung is the single A, uh, or the A stroke uh, is what Atung is talking about. And basically, it's like a tongue of fire <laughs> visualized in the navel chakra and directing all the wind energies that are moving in the subsidiary channels, directing all of that in through the central channel. So that was Gampopa's main training for those 13 months. And then the next few pages is all the different experiences that occurred. And uh, not very relevant per se <laughs> to us, this is particular to Milarepa's experiences. So it basically told a whole bunch of experiences, visions, you know, visionary experiences that Gampopa had, that Gampopa thought was, you know, very special, you know, visions of Buddhas, visions of things clearing and things, magnificent things happening. But basically, 
Milarepa guided him through. If there's anything to learn from these visions is that uh, what were seemingly positive signs, Milarepa said, and they're not a big deal. And what were seemingly negative signs, Milarepa in fact said, actually, they are good. <laughs> that goes on for a few pages. <laughs> that goes on until page 514 at the bottom. Son, if you want to be a genuine meditator, you should not have great attachment to the omens in your dreams, in your visions. If you do, you will become influenced by demons. Only follow the instructions of the guru and your own determination. Do not heed others' advice. Don't, don't, don't go asking other people, as it is the cause for your mind becoming confused. Your mind starts wondering. Do not look for the faults of your companions around you. So good advice. Even as you become more and more refined in your understanding, in your commitment to the Dharma, don't be critical of the people that are around you. Leave them alone. That's not your business. Don't give sway to unwholesome thoughts. Don't involve yourself in correcting others. Not your business. <laughs> Not knowing others' mind stream is a cause for downfall, meaning when you don't have the power to really perceive what's going on in people's hearts, people's minds, and can only see what they're doing exterior on the exterior, that could lead to a lot of trouble if you try to correct others. In other words, as we would say, don't judge others. Mind your own business. Five fifteen is when uh, a set of instructions are given, uh, where he relates the different bardos. Uh, he relates the normal definition of bardo, meaning the intermediate states. Uh, so, in traditional teachings, that are said to be six types of bardo. Uh, the four uh, first, the four, the painful bardo of dying. The luminous bardo of uh, dharmata, or reality. The karmic uh, uh, bardo of becoming, uh, that means rebirth. And then the natural bardo of this life. These are the four bardos. Then to that is also, then within the bardo of this life, there are two other bardos that happen within the natural bardo of this life, which is the bardo of uh, meditative states and the bardo of the dream state, uh, dreams. So bardo means in between, intervals. That means uh, where things are shaken up. So in meditative states, things are shaken up uh, in a particular way. Then in dreams, uh, things are also shaken up in a particular way. So here in this teaching on the bardos, uh, he, he is uh, talking about some of these traditional bardos, but he's relating it to the view, meditation, and conduct. Uh, and fruition. Uh, for view, meditation, conduct, fruition. that he relates to the bardo of meditation, the bardo of dreaming, and then he calls the bardo of vital points, the bardo of three kayas. So here is a different uh, uh, set of bardos. <laughs> Next time we meet, we will go through uh, here. We'll start from here, 5.15. Here there's more like uh, instructions that I think are relevant to us. 
all the conversations between Milarepa and Gampopa up to this point, they're all particular to Gampopa's, you know, experiences. Which summary for all of that is, I, I would say, the bottom of 514. Don't rely on these dreams and visions, especially if you don't have a guru who can guide, who can actually tell you what they are all about. If you, if you get swayed by these dreams and visions, those that you habitually label as positive or negative, you'll be led astray. Questions, <laughs> comments. Yeah, I'm still struck by that. We have years, I don't know how long Rachungpa was with, with uh, Milarepa. Mm -hmm. It seems like years, so it's certainly- Oh yeah, many years. 500 pages worth or something, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And, and then Ampopa kind of shows up at the very end of his life and there's this hagiography or however you say that. Right, yes. Hero's journey, you know, very quick, you know, it's just like suddenly this guy comes in. And then we also know, as you were talking earlier, is that, that Ampopa, yeah, takes it in and then is so long after a year or so and because uh, he's ready to do so. And then he yes. establishes, his, you know, he kind of sorts through what he's learned and blends things and so forth. And that becomes Milarepa's legacy. Yes. And uh, at the same time, it just made me wonder, it's like, a, it was, you know, if Milrepa was all everybody says he was, he was kind of like, yeah, that's fine. Uh huh. That's yep. And it made me wonder about <coughs> Milrepa, what Milrepa took from Marpa, and how he morphed it in his own shape. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I don't know. Do you know? Did we get a whole lot of what Marpa gave over to Milrepa? Uh, Not much, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, only the crucial points. Yeah. Milarepa was also with Marpa for only a short time. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Short I mean, time. You know, short time after the towers because that. Yeah, two, 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 three years. Wow. I thought it was a lot longer than that. Yeah, no. And so in that case, right, I remember I said Lama Ngo, Ngo Chuku Dorje was the one uh, that was with Marpa for a long time. Right. And that was the main successor, just like Rei Chongpa was the main successor of Milarepa. So again, history is written backwards. <laughs> this theme uh, of like, you know, someone mysteriously arriving from nowhere, yeah. it captures everything and goes and, you know, becomes the main successor, right? This theme, I think, uh, occurs um, all, all over the place. Uh, for those of you who know the Zen tradition, this is the this theme is right there with the fifth um, when the fifth patriarch was choosing choosing a successor. Hmm. The sixth patriarch Hui Neng, was a nobody that came from the barbaric south uh, and came up north, illiterate. Uh, and everybody was expecting the main student of the fifth patriarch to be the, the sixth patriarch, uh, the one by the name of Shen Xiu. Shen Xiu was educated, came from an aristocratic family. You know, everybody in the fifth patriarch's community was like, yeah, he is the guy, he is the guy. So what does the fifth patriarch do? He declares this country bumpkin, who wasn't even a monk at that point. Uh, and said, you are my true successor and now leave in the middle of the night, you know, before other people, you know, out of jealousy harm you. 
Then he he leaves, you know, he goes off. Then only six, seven years later, you know, he goes public and said, I'm the successor. <laughs> then in the Bible, right? And, uh, although that's a parable, but but this 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 theme, you know, yeah. and the prodigal son, right? Right. Yeah, the, the son, the poor son that was there, you know, serving dad faithfully doesn't get the special treatment you know it's it's the long lost son that turns up like aha you're back <laughs> and i think it's because history is written backwards in a way you know and this might be a you know liberal american reading of these material right in a way, you know, you succeed when you are not encumbered by <laughs> too much tradition. Yes, you, ru you run away with the stuff and then you make a name for yourself. <laughs> well, you know, maybe some kind of deep-seated distrust of, of bureaucracy, you know. Of well, again, that's an American reading, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. But the experience of countless eons of people, you know, dealing with governments that have transformed into, you know, from rebels to institutions and then- But Milarepa, you know, in Milarepa's case, right, is Rejumpa is the complete opposite of bureaucracy. We had expectations. <laughs> that was the seat of it, wasn't uh, it? I mean, there wasn't no, no, no. They were itinerant oh, okay. going from cave to cave. If anything, Gampopa started the institution. Yeah. <laughs> All right, point taken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if anything, Gampopa institutionalized the Kagyu and Gampopa's right. disciples. Right. The great monasteries all came from Gampopa. You know, Gampopa himself, uh, even though you know, the, the, the later sources talk about, oh, he started Gampo Monastery. It wasn't a monastery. It, it was a mountain with many caves, right. with many monks meditating in them. Now, only later huh, was a physical monastery built. Interesting. Well, you know, and, and they make a point of saying that, um, in the song it makes a point of saying, that Milrepa himself said, no, I have a student coming who will be passing my teachings on. Yes. And uh, is that a rewrite? No, not necessarily, because yeah. now we know, like, right? I mean, <laughs> Gampopa did it, you know, from Gampopa. If there was no Gampopa, Milarepa would have been forgotten. Uh, at the very end of this chapter, yeah, 523, uh, these was Milarepa's words to his band of, you know, unruly, <laughs> his band of unruly itinerant, right? After the prim and proper monk left, yeah? yeah. Uh, after, the, after a slight disruption, yeah, right? 523. Then Jason went to Chua, where his disciple sons had gathered, right? meaning Rechungpa and the others. He said, the teacher physician will benefit many sentient beings. Last night, I dreamt that a single voucher flew from where I was to U, where he landed upon the peak of a great mountain. In every direction, it was surrounded by many geese. Then after a while, the geese lifted off, each gathering 500 more of their own retinue, and the valley became completely filled with geese. This shows that while I am a lay yogi, later, there will be many monks in my lineage. Now I have fulfilled my duty to the Buddha's teachings. And he was very pleased. I could read to the end. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there's perhaps also a sense, right? I mean, to kind of imagine, right? Yeah. Uh, this, uh, play this out, right? I can imagine if I was sitting there, right? And then maybe just my delusions. If I was sitting there, part of that band of, you know, itinerant disciples, almost like, oh, good, burden is off us. 
that guy can go do his thing. And now we we like to wander in the mountains. We, we, we don't want to deal with a lot of people. Uh, that, I think you could read it that way too. Milarepa says, now my job is done. This guy, this guy, this, this prim and proper, you know, a little bit tight whew, monk, he will go deal with the masses. Now let's continue on wandering from place to place without a care. You know? I read, I, I read that as that way. I, I read it that way, you know? And, and this is what Milarepa prefers. Does he want to deal with the masses? No. <laughs> he's not built. He's not constituted that way. Probably Rei Chungpa is like, yes, good. You know? I was going to ask you, so we hear no more about Rachumpa. I mean, after Kapumpa is designated as the one, we no longer hear any more about Rachumpa and what his life is. Well, we don't because, right, the way this, this volume is collected, uh, there is two more chapters of two other disciples, or two or three, uh, Lotun Gindun, Dreton Repa, and Liko Charwa, and then it just drops off like that, you know. And Liko Chur Charwa was a monk too. So there's another monk disciple. Uh, Drayton was famed as a meditation teacher. And that's chapter 43. And then Lotun Gindun. Lotun Gindun might be a monk as well. But as far as the favorite for Champa was Milarepa's quote unquote favorite. Yeah, we we in these three chapters, I don't think he figures. Yep. Yeah. And, and well, my point is that this collection wasn't meant to be read as a biography right. in any case. Right. Yeah. So so it's just that the material stopped, you know. Right. Uh, now, under miscellaneous stories, the third section of this collection, I'm sure Rechumpa turns back up. Yeah. But from the life of Milarepa, the, the, the book that Zhang Nyong Heruka, the biography that Zhang Nyong Heruka, the same compiler, put together. Uh, Rei Chungpa was with Milarepa all the way to the end when Milarepa passes. Mm. Gampopa wasn't there, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you, you can imagine, no, Rei Chungpa did not drop off. Rei Chungpa continued to serve the Lama until the Lama passed away, you know? All right. Then my guess is Rei Chungpa became quite, you know, quite you know, uh, naturally, uh, then the head of mm -hmm. that community as they wandered on. <laughs> right, yeah. And we know like Rei Chungpa's lineage continued for, you know, a few generations. Yeah. At least. Um, just lost to us right now. Yeah. Uh, some some Western scholar actually did a dissertation on Rei Chungpa, so there might be more information there. How long that 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 community, you know, continue? But by by the nature of that community, it's a community that didn't particularly care to develop community. Mm -hmm. You see, by nature they want to be disbanded. <laughs> <laughs> You know, by nature, they want to disband. <laughs> uh, we can't hear you, Cheryl. Well, and yet, somehow, we still have the teachings that Milarepa gave to them because we have the songs, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and, and probably compiled by Zhang Yong Heruka uh, from Rei Chungpa's. From them, yeah. Because it would not have come to us from Gampopa. Gampopa wasn't present, right? All right. 
he only came in in a very short slice for 13 months and he never heard all these other things yes yeah <laughs> so, so Rup is famous because of the songs really as much as Kampopa, but his book is the most like right These yes songs, like, the whole yes book. and so in a way Ray Chongpa's and Ray Chongpa's community preserved these songs right then came into the hands of Zhang Yong Heruka uh, who then put them all together. Zhang Yong Heruka himself was more like Rei Chongpa. So that's also an interesting footnote. Uh, Zhang Yong Heruka was not a monk. Uh, in fact, Zhang Yong Heruka was kind of a crazy yogi, uh, quite outrageous in his own, a uh, uh, little controversial, you know, like, oh, what is this, you know? Uh, Zhang Yong means crazy man. Uh, crazy, Nyong is crazy. Uh, crazy man from Zhang. Uh, Wu Chang, Chang is one part of central <laughs> Tibet. Uh, so the crazy guy from Chang was his, <laughs> the name he adopted for himself, Chang Yong Heruka. Heruka means like, you know, wrathful Buddha. <laughs> so his name was Chang Yong Heruka. So his, his style was more uh, Milarepa Rechongpa style. But by, by that point, he could not ignore the fact that the main successors of Milarepa were mostly in monastic institutions, what we now know as Kagyupas. Interesting. Yeah. Now, even like in the modern, right? Uh, I will say a few words before we have to go. <laughs> now, even in the modern uh, kind of, um, you could say, this is a, my bias uh, read of like modern Kagyupas. Yeah. In the history of the Kagyupa family in the modern period, meaning in the last 200 years, let's say. Yeah. So the Kagyupa traditions that remain intact, and 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 I'm and then what do I mean by intact? Meaning they have maintained their institutional identity. So you can point to specific monasteries and say, that's, that's the head monastery. And then there's a whole bunch of monasteries related to this head monasteries. In terms of that, four uh, Kagyu traditions remain intact. Uh, Karma Kagyu, and I'm naming them in terms of size and prominence. Karma Kagyu, followed by Drupa Kagyu, followed by Drigong Kagyu, and lagging way behind, Talong Kagyu. Talong Kagyu is like by a thread, <laughs> still in existence, intact. Uh, you could further divide and say, Karma Kagyu and Drupa Kagyu, uh, mm, very much intact. <laughs> and, and, Big. Uh, Drigong Kagyu is somewhere in the middle, a little behind uh, these two, and Talong Kagyu way behind, institutionally speaking. In Talong Kagyu's case, they are, I, I don't know much to say anything about why they are so small in numbers. Yeah. But in the last 200 years, at least. Karma Kagyu and Drupa Kagyu has become very prominent, at least within the Kagyu family, in part because they really produce uh, many scholars and scholars who gain great prominence through their scholarship. And also, they were very uh, they were very much in tune with the trends of their days. And so they also developed great ritual systems, like very fancy <laughs> public ceremonies. 
permacagyu and drupokagyu. Drigomkagyu, don't have that kind of prominence. We don't have uh, the last like kind of prominent scholar was maybe in the 17th century in Jigongkagyu. So for the last six centuries, I don't think we have any prominent scholars. Uh, ritual, not very fancy. Uh, if just simply looking at, for example, Tormas, you all know Tormas, right? This butter sculpture. Yeah. 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 When you look at Dragunkagyu Torma traditions, it's so primitive. Huh. Almost kind of embarrassing. Very plain. But there's a video produced of the Karmakagyu Tormas. Oh my goodness. So fancy, so refined, you know. Uh, Drupakagyu too, like like on a daily basis, you know. I watch, you know, on Facebook, you know, <laughs> YouTube, and you watch the Karmakagyu doing their rituals. You got you watch the Drupakagyu doing their rituals, and you're like, wow, that's impressive, you know. And in Drigong, we we don't have that. What we do have is by nature not displayable. We have people in caves. <laughs> people in caves who have no interest in letting other people know that they're in caves. Yeah, so when Mingyu Rinpoche, right? You all know Mingyu Rinpoche, I'm sure. It's become very famous disappeared for three, four years, right? And he only disappeared from public view. We knew where he was, like not me. He was up with the Drigong monks in caves in Lapchi. So our majority Lapchi is Drigong monks in caves. He went up there. And our cave monks have no interest in telling the world who is up here. <laughs> and now he has come back down and become even more famous. And they've made a video about him being up in caves. But the majority of the guys in caves are like, please don't come up here. <laughs> Leave us alone. <laughs> so we're a little bit worried about that video. <laughs> like now there'll be all these people coming up. You know, the Lapchi trying to figure out. Stampede. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 leave us alone, you know. We 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 want to be left alone. So Dragon Kagyu, you know, has maintained in a way some of this, you know, tell the world to please leave us alone. So yeah, we we among you know those you know so-called teachers, uh, we, we talk about this you know we're like you know we are kind of stuck you know as teachers who have public you know engagement. Mm -hmm. On from that perspective, we're trying to spread you know, but then at the heart of our tradition is you know go away all of you leave us alone. <laughs> so we're like not sure what to do you know. Uh, whereas if you are Kamakagyu, Drupokagyu, it's a lot easier. <laughs> so then we also become a little self-conscious, you know, uh, because we're out, out doing these public things, you know. Then when we try to do a public ritual, we're like, you know, before long, someone is going to catch on and go, wait, that's not, that's not very refined. <laughs> like, is that it? That's all you have? It's like, mm, yeah, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so and scholarship uh, even way way behind so we have no scholarship to show 
we have no fancy rituals to show. And if there's realization, it's not those of us who are running around here, up in the mountains. And we have, so we can't show that, even if we have that. So a little, <laughs> neither here nor there. <laughs> ah, anyway. That's so wonderful though. Thank you. I can't I can't tell you. It's just I mean we're sitting here in Little Rock, Arkansas, right? We haven't got any caves even, let alone <laughs> anybody sitting in them or, <laughs> or any of that. So it's really wonderful how you bring to life all of this uh -huh. rich, amazing stuff. <laughs> go right over our heads without your help so <laughs> i'm very grateful yeah well we can have our caves so yeah we have to have our own caves. i'll share with you one reading it's a translation of one of jidin uh, instructions uh let me see if i can pull it up yeah mm. The, if we get kicked out, it'll just be the twelve-step people taking over. The right. Game. So, but right. Go ahead and read it. I think it'll be good. Yeah. Go this is about um, mm, like we're not there, but we can be there. <laughs> the title is called "How to Bless the Land Wherever You Practice." Bless in the sense of transforming where you are. So it goes like this. Engender a tender heart of love and compassion for the land of the place wherever you live and for the people and most of all, the non-human beings who live there too. Do this again and again with sincerity. And when you feel it deep within your heart, it will bring an immense amount of benefit to the material things like earth, stone, and wood. This is something to keep in your minds, sublime beings. At the time when this is brought to culmination, visualize your particular land first and foremost, and all other lands and regions as the great Lord of compassion himself. Cultivate love, compassion, and bodhicitta time and time again with great sincerity for all of the beings who live there and for every last sentient being. Imagine the ground where you are as the Vajra seat at Bodh Gaya. Consciously dedicate your root of virtue time and time again for the well-being and happiness of mother sentient beings who live where you are. It has been taught by our guru, the Buddha himself, that this practice can never fail. Of this, I have experienced and you great beings should take this into your own experience as well. The noble ones who were greatness itself and the bodhisattvas of the past blessed the ground of the land wherever they stayed in this way. To ensure auspiciousness and goodness, when the construction of a house was completed, they would make offerings to the three jewels, honor and serve the Sangha community, offer torments to all the elemental spirits and make vast aspirations again and again. The way of the masters of bygone times is difficult indeed, yet if you practice it, blessing will arise. It is this that you should keep in your heart. Wow. <laughs> I said to uh, our Wednesday night group when I shared with them, shared this with them. I said, "This puts you know us llamas out of business because it's saying you don't need us to sprinkle water and scatter rice and bless this and bless that." He says, "You bless where you live with love, compassion, and bodhicitta, and that place transforms into Bodhgaya. So you can make your caves, you know, in Little Rock, yeah. with love, compassion, and bodhicitta." <laughs> Then every rock, every piece of wood, you know, mm -hmm. every clump of earth 
become sanctified by our love, compassion, and bodhicitta. <laughs> Congratulations, Sarah, on bodhicitta vows. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you should practice it right now, according to Jigden Sumgan. Bless a little rock. <laughs> <laughs> to become holy rock. <laughs> and as Jesus says, and upon this rock, I shall build my church. So now EBS has a big job to do. <laughs> okay, ta-ta. Ta-ta. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. When will we see you again, do you know? Um, maybe next Sunday. Um, I, I don't know. I don't. Often I forget, you know, something that might turn up on Sunday, but I'm not remembering if I have anything. Okay. Uh, it might be that I have to paint or move things at the new center. Uh, yeah. Uh, but we'll see. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Good to be with everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Bye. Bye.